Well, we are getting close to the end of our study. Just this session and one more. And you know, as I've been going through this, I don't know about you, but I kind of been getting annoyed with constantly hearing or having to think about being an exile. And parts of me just want to say, I get it, move on. But I'm reminded of something one of my high school teachers used to say. She used to tell our class that when we read scripture and it repeats itself, or when we read scripture and then we see it played out in real life, God is trying to get our attention. It's like he's clearing his throat loudly so that I will perk up and listen. Have you ever had a, a parent or, or a teacher or someone clear their throat at you to catch your attention? The <clears throat> and I believe that when we hear these same things over and over and over again, it's like God is clearing his throat at us, making sure that we catch it. Because, you know, sometimes we miss it the first time. Uh, sometimes we miss it the first and second time. And so things have to be repeated. This is just a part of who we are as humans. And it's something that we work on. I mean, this is an idea that I've been trying to help my sons understand. I've been telling them, look, you need to listen the first time. Because that just doesn't come naturally to us. So as we continue in this section of First Peter, I want us to, to understand that we are going to see some throat clearings. And so God, through Peter, is going to be trying to get our attention and trying to make sure that we're not missing something that he's been saying for the past chapters. He wants to make sure that we catch some of these important ideas. So as we go through this, rather than thinking, oh, well, I've heard that before and kind of shut off your brain a little bit. Instead, I ask that you think, wow, what was that again? It must really be important because he's been saying it more than once. And so instead of tuning out a repetition, let's hone in on what he is saying. So let's take a look. First Peter chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 13. Here's what it says. First Peter 3 verses 13 through 19. Who then will harm you if you are devoted to what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear or be intimidated, but in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that when you are accused, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if, it, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for our sins, once for all the righteousness for the, uh, once for all the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison. So here's our first major throat clearing. Here's our first major pay attention. Did you get this when I told you before? Suffering is real. It happens. Temporary suffering happens even if you are doing good. But remember, it is temporary. It is not eternal. And so how should you respond? Be ready to give an answer, a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. Now, let's be clear. We are not going to be able to give an apologetic or a defense answer for every question that comes up. Studying Christian apologetics is a good thing, but I don't think that is exactly where Peter is going with with this verse. Um, instead, take a look at the end of what he says. It says, a defense for what? The reason for the hope that is in you. The answer for the hope that is in you is the gospel lived out through your testimony of how Jesus has changed and is working in your life. And when you give a defense, you are taking a stand for what you believe in. So amidst suffering, amidst persecution, make sure you are taking a stand for Christ, for your faith. Do not be intimidated 
by the fear that they wish to bring against you. Instead, and here's how an exile in this world responds, when you take your stand, when you share your testimony, those are given. When you do those things, you do them with gentleness and respect. Now, wow, that is hard. Like, not to take a stand in defiance. That tends to come easier to take a stand because I'm being defiant of what is happening. But it is much harder to take a stand with gentleness and respect. Why do we do this? Because this is so opposite of the kingdom of this world. This is so opposite for how this world tells you to act when others are, are persecuting you or are against you. This is so different than that, that people are going to notice something different about you. They're going to notice Christ in you. For it is better to suffer for doing good. For doing good, not for doing evil. You want the power of God to help you through that suffering? Then you need to make sure that the reason you're suffering is because you are walking his path, not because you are in defiance of the kingdom of God. You want to make sure that you are suffering because you are acting like Christ. And don't forget, Christ also suffered. And who did he suffer for? He suffered for the righteous and the unrighteous. He suffered for those people who are persecuting you. He suffered for those who are at odds with you. Christ died for them too. He wants them to repent and be saved. So make sure your actions don't hinder that possibility. Make sure your actions point to who Christ is and how much Christ desires for them to come know him. Because remember, at one point in time in your life, you were unrighteous. You were lost like them. And praise God that Christ desires all of us to come and know him as our personal Lord and Savior. So we need to make sure that the actions that we portray, the way we live our life, does not hinder the work that God is doing in an unrighteous person. Now the next section is kind of confusing. And as I did some studying on it, I realized that uh, there is a lot of different uh, theories about what exactly is being said here. It would take a lot of a long time to research and discuss this, and that just doesn't work on an, in an online video like this. Uh, but I don't want to miss the overarching idea. And that's this: Christ suffered and died for you and for me, cleansing us from all of our unrighteousness because of his resurrection. And now he is in heaven at the right hand of God, in power with angels, authorities, and other powers subject to him. We see clearly here who is in control, and it is Jesus. Now, this is crucial context uh, to come from so that we can understand chapter 4. We need to re remember how much power Jesus has, that all authority is subjected to him. We need to remember that as we look at chapter 4. Because here again, we are going to see evidence of the kingdom of this world versus evidence of the kingdom of God. We're going to see how those two kingdoms act differently. So let's take a look at chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And I want you to pay attention to who is in control. 1 Peter 4, 1 through 6. Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same understanding, because the one who suffers in the flesh is finished with sin, in order to live the remaining time in the flesh, no longer for human desires, but for God's will. For there has already been enough time spent in doing what the Gentiles chose to do, carrying on in unrestrained behavior, evil desires, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and lawless idolatry. They are surprised that you don't join them in the same flood of wild living, and they slander you. They will give you an account of they will give an account to the one who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. 
For this reason, the gospel was also preached to those who are now dead, so that although they might be judged in the flesh according to human standards, they might live in the Spirit according to God's standards. Did you catch it? Did you catch who is in control here? Christ. Christ is in control. Again, you will be slandered because you don't do the things that the world does. It will confuse them. They won't know how to respond because you are living for a different kingdom as your home. You are living as an exile who doesn't belong here. And so the rules that you live by, the the way you live your life, the knowledge of the hope that is to come that dictates how you walk doesn't make sense to them. And they will slander you. But as Christ begins to bring more of his kingdom to this earth, you have a very important job. You need to be sober-minded, self-controlled, so that you can pray. And I'll be the first to tell you that there are certain things that I don't understand about prayer. And God is consistently growing me in this and and teaching me new things and helping me learn uh, what he wants me to do in my prayer life. And so I have no way, there's no way that I have arrived when it comes to prayer. But there are some things that I know that he has taught me. And that's this. He has taught me that prayer has a lot to do with listening to what God is saying. And then allowing him to speak and calling forth what he has promised. So if we want to know what to ask for, if we want to know how God is leading, if we want to be effective in our prayers, we need to be listening to him. Listening to what he is saying, listening and watching how he is moving, how he is working in this world and praying for what he tells us to pray for. And then we get another quick kind of throat clearing again when Peter says, love one another because love covers a multitude of sins. You see, we will mess up as Christians. We will make mistakes. We are still human. And even though we are living for the kingdom of God, we still make mistakes and we need other Christians love to cover those multitude of sins. When we mess up, we need Christians to love us in a way that covers those mistakes. Because that is contrary to how the world works. In the world, when someone makes a mistake and they offend you, uh, they, in this case, in the world today, we say they cancel culture. They get rid of it. You're no longer there. It's like they delete you. But no, as an exile in the kingdom of God, when a mistake is made, when a sin happens, We love. We love Christians so that we cover their sins. So that they can continue living, pointing to the kingdom. Rather than being at odds with other Christians when they make a mistake, our job is to show them Christ's love. And then it says we need to be hospitable to one another and not complain when we are doing that, because that is also a mark of of an exile. To be hospitable, sure, the world does that, but a lot of times it's done because they want something, or they want the good feeling that it brings, or they want a favor in return, or it's going to get them something. But no, not as Christians. We are hospitable because Christ is hospitable to us. No strings attached, no complaining, but because we are following in the footsteps of Christ. Now, I want you to hone in on this part, and I'm going to paraphrase this part of chapter 4. It says this, and this is looking at verses 7 through 11 of chapter 4. We do things for God's glory. That is why we were given gifts. So even in our strengths, even in our gifts, we need to make sure that we are using them with his power, so that he will be glorified. In fact, he will be glorified because what we will do will be far greater than what I could do on my own with my gift. So use your gifts for God 
and through God. Here's what I mean. God has given us natural abilities, different ones to each person. And these aren't necessarily just spiritual gifts, but things that you're good at, passions that you have. God has blessed us with things that just come naturally that we can do. And it is important for us to be using them for his kingdom and for his church, for the benefit of the kingdom of God, not just for the benefit of this earth, but they need to be used to point others towards God's kingdom so that God will be glorified. And when you use your gifts and you use them in a way that allows God to to empower you, those gifts become even greater. So look at what God is doing. Ask him where he wants you to use your gift and then allow him to empower you so your gift doesn't just get used in a small way, but it gets used in a God way, in an amazing way that impacts the generations. And now we get to our final throat clearing for this section, verses 12 through 19. And if when you look over this, you'll notice that we've heard all of this before. But again, the repetition of this idea must be important because it is brought up multiple times in this book. And so your homework is to meditate on this section. Meditate on this section throughout the week, asking God to open your heart and your mind so that he can speak to you. And so as we end today's session, I just want to read this part together. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. Dear friends, don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes along or comes among you to test you as if something unusual were happening to you. Instead, rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may also rejoice with the great joy when his glory is revealed. If you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in having that name. For the time has come for judgment to begin with God's household, and if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who disobey the gospel of God? And if a righteous person is saved with difficulty, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust themselves to a faithful creator while doing what is good.